Hey everybody, it's Bob Crossan, Senior Managing Editor for Water and Waste Digest. Today I have with me Keith Bircher. He's Global Product Manager UV for Denora Water Technologies. I also have Alex Bettinardi. He is the Global Product Manager Ozone for Denora Water Technologies. And we're going to be talking all about 1,4-Dioxane. So thank you both for being on the call. I appreciate you taking the time today. You're welcome. Welcome, well, thank you. So I want to set the stage here. Let's start with the very the very first question that we probably should answer, which is, what even is 1,4-Dioxane? <laughs> well, 1,4-Dioxane is a, a, a chemical compound that is uh, used has been used historically as a stabler stabilizer for chlorinated solvents. Uh, it's also used in pharmaceuticals as a purifying agent. Uh, etc. So it was used quite extensively within the industry, at least in the past. A lot of its uses have been discontinued now. Mm -hmm. So it, it, where can you find, can you find this in the environment? And if so, where can you find 1,4-Dioxane in the environment? Um, yeah, it's found extensively um, in the environment, uh, in groundwater uh, sources, as well as surface water sources of drinking water. In uh, in North America, uh, um, under the um, the monitoring rules put out by the US EPA for public water systems, uh, that concluded in 2015, it was found that about a thousand different public water sites and their source water, um, and uh, it, encompassing about 45 states in the US. So it was quite pervasive. About 300 of those were over there. Um, action level or their monitoring level but a lot of them were very low levels but it was still found pervasively in the environment yeah oh that's interesting i didn't realize quite how uh how pervasive it really was i knew that this has been an issue for a lot of utilities but uh to know that it's even more vast i think than i thought <laughs> it's kind of alarming <laughs> <laughs> right yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, what, what can exposure to this uh, present in terms of health risks? Um, are there health risks linked to the, to 1,4-Dioxane? What type of exposure problems exist when it comes to humans or environmental factors? Yeah, I, I can take this one, Kate. Uh, different organizations uh, have defined 1,4-Dioxane slightly different way, but they all agree that uh, uh, it can be a human carcinogen. Um, the um, HHS uh, Health and Human Services uh, considers the 1,4-Dioxane reasonably anticipated to, uh, to be a human carcinogen. And if we look at the EPA, the EPA established that 1,4-Dioxane is a probable human carcinogen. So uh, different um, organization uh, uh, agrees that definitely can be very dangerous at the level to be a human carcinogen. Yeah. So then, obviously, you're going to want to remove this. How do you detect it, first of all? Um, what technologies exist in terms of detection? And um, how are utilities detecting for 1,4-Dioxane? Well, the detection is uh, not, let's say, simple. Actually, detection and water analysis are performed by uh, normally third-party certified uh, lab and specialized lab. Uh, because uh, the, it's not just a probe you put in the water. Um, there are methodologies that involve a quite complex uh, uh, equipment and, and, and methodologies such as gas chromatography. So uh, normally uh, utilities uh, uh, needs to take samples, send it to a certified specialized lab to be able to detect it. Also because the concentration uh, the technique normally is in micrograms uh, per liter, so PPB, so pretty low, mm -hmm. but still dangerous. Yeah, yeah, that that's interesting, and and I imagine there are a lot of utilities that just simply don't have the resources or the technology to necessarily detect it if it is this. Uh, if it does take such high level technology to to do so and I, th I think most utilities are outsourcing a lot of their testing anyway, <laughs> but um, so. Uh, say say that a utility has found it. They've done the sampling. Their their external lab has said, "Hey, you have this in here." Um, how are they going to go about treating it? What technologies exist there? How can they remediate? How can they eliminate 1,4-Dioxane in their water? 
I think firstly, it's a matter of whether it's regulated or not. Right now, it's not by the US EPA, at least regulated compound where they have to treat it. So okay. often it's, it's it, in some states, it's if it's found in the drinking water source, the, the public water a utility decides on their own that they will treat it. Um, in New York, for instance, they have brought in New York State, they have brought in regulations that requires that they treat it. And those regulations were brought in about a year ago. And so they are in the process of actually starting to institute treatment systems. But there are other uh, public systems that have started to treat it. If they want to, to treat it, uh, I guess there are two um, main uh, methods for treatment. Um, and first, I'll say the ones that don't work, it's like it's a very, very soluble in water and therefore it's not um, uh, treated by activated carbon, absorbed onto activated carbon readily. It's also because it's very miscible in water, it's not air stripped very well. And those are common treatment methods for uh, removing organic contaminants out of water. So the, the main two processes that can be used would be uh, advanced oxidation processes such as UV and hydrogen peroxide or ozone and hydrogen peroxide to generate hydroxyl radicals that will then oxidize the 1,4-dioxane and thereby remove it from the water. Got it. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, uh, and I was just at the water reuse symposium recently and they were talking about how effective ROUVAOP is at handling a majority of the problems that most water utilities have to deal with. Um, so to hear that it does work with 1,4-dioxane is uh, really um, uh, illuminating, I would say. <laughs> no, that is true. And it is, it is also um, uh, used to treat 1,4-dioxane in reuse facilities. So it is oh, found uh, in, um, in the RO permeate because of its solubility and small size, it does kind of get through the RO membranes to some degree. And so it has been found there. And so in California, for instance, they have a requirement that if you are putting in a reuse system, a portable reuse system, that is, uh, that you remove, um, that you treat at least half a log of 1,4-dioxane. Mm -hmm. And doing that is also somewhat of a surrogate for, for um, saying if we treat a half a log of 1,4-dioxane, we're also getting other potential contaminants of concern, such as pharmaceuticals, other things that might be in the drinking water, because it's coming from a wastewater source. Yeah. Now, on, on, in terms of 1,4-dioxane, obviously, Denora has solutions on both of the fronts that you mentioned. Could you uh, talk a little bit about what you do in terms of considerations and um, getting utilities involved and getting the right technologies in the right spot for 1,4-dioxane? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, uh, when when it comes to advanced oxidation processes, the, the chemistry involved might be very complex and each water is unique. So piloting for, for this type of process is, uh, is fundamental, is, always, uh, is often mandatory. So uh, some preliminary bench scale test and then on-site uh, type of pilot become mandatory also to consult our customers and and decide what is the best approach for them uh, of course if the uh, uv transmittance of the water uh, is is pretty high then the uv peroxide uh, becomes a valuable solution and uh, much cheaper and more eff efficient than ozone but when it comes to uh, water containing a high toc level uh, and containing uh, a, a, or with a, a bad turbidity, so low, um, so low transmittance value, then uh, the uh, ozone peroxide, the ozone AOP approach become the best solution for them. And these are just two variables, but then others, uh, other aspects need to be con considered such as the uh, energy cost, the chemical cost, the oxygen cost. So it's always, a, yes, a process evaluation, but also an OPEX versus CAPEX evaluation that is unique for each individual site and customer. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing from you is what I hear often is uh, some of these, thing, these things are quite complex and 
the best course of action after you've determined what technology you need is to find a professional like one of you two <laughs> to really determine uh, how, how to best implement it and optimize it for your particular system. Um, <laughs> so it's just good to know that that's, that's still the same thing for, uh, for you guys as well. Well, I, I do appreciate you guys taking the time. For everyone who's watching this video, definitely check out the video description below. We'll have some links for Denora Technologies and some of the things that they have going on there, both from the UV front, the ozone front, um, and and to both uh, Keith and Alex, thank you so much for being here and talking about your technologies at Denora Water Technologies. Uh, thanks a lot, Bob. It was a pleasure, really. You're welcome. Thank you.